This week, we'll see in Ezekiel that when we don't respond to hardships the way people expect, we get their attention. I heard a recent clear example of that when David Jackson spoke at his father's memorial service. I asked David if I could use this clip, and he said I could, as long as I made him look 30 pounds lighter. So I've done that. But personally, I think he looks better at his normal size, so I've taken the liberty of not editing the whole clip. I loved his singing, and I'll miss that. When we were in the ICU, we sang a lot to him, and the whole ICU could hear it. And a lot of people were touched. Several nurses came in and said, you know, you blessed the entire ICU. There was apparently one Muslim doctor that came up to one of the nurses and says, what are they doing in there? She said, they're singing. And he said, but is, is he, is, isn't he dying? She said, yes. He said, well, they sound happy. Why are they happy? And she said, because he knows Jesus. It's because of Jesus. And uh, the several, a couple, several others kept telling us what a testimony it was. One of the nurses came in as a new believer and said, when I go, I want to go like this. I want to go surrounded by a family that loves me like y'all love him. And uh, she said that over and over again to us. And we got her name and because she's praying for her family to become Christians. She's one of the first generation Christians in her world. This is exactly the idea that I want to try to communicate today. When we don't respond to hardship the way people expect, whether believers or non-believers, we get their attention. We witness to them by our faith and obedience and by the presence of God in our lives. The text this morning is Ezekiel 24, 15 to 27, in which God commands Ezekiel to have a response to death that is unnatural, the opposite of the normal human response to suffering that we would expect and, and really that we would want. We, let's read about this, his loss first in Ezekiel 24, 15 to 18. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke, yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put on your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. The book of Ezekiel is divided into three parts. In chapter 24, this chapter is the end of the first part. In that part, Ezekiel is speaking out against the evil heart condition of the people of God and the rulers of Israel. Their wickedness, their idolatry, their seeking of human solutions has put them on a path toward destruction and the destruction of their city, Jerusalem. But here, but in that section, Ezekiel has repeatedly offered glimpses of hope, renewal, and return from exile. Back in chapter 9, Ezekiel saw a vision in which the Lord instructed an angelic being to pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and to put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. That group would be spared. In chapter 20, which we studied last week, we saw that God did promise restoration from exile, a restoration too big for B.C., in which those who loathed themselves for the evils they had committed would know that he was the Lord because he would deal with them for his name's sake, not according to their evil ways or corrupt deeds. Mercy, forgiveness, that's what he's promising. So I believe God, through Ezekiel, is asking the ones among the exiles who sigh and groan, who loathe their sinfulness, how will you react when God destroys Jerusalem? How will you handle that grief? And to get at that question, God gives Ezekiel grievous news. Son of man, behold, I'm about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. We find out in verse 18 that the delight of his eyes is his wife, which in itself is kind of a great thing. 
We would not have guessed that this fiery prophet was delightfully and tenderly married. But he was. And that one line provides as much marriage counsel as some whole books. Is your wife the delight of your eyes? It's God's design. But now she'll be taken away at a stroke, probably by plague or disease, according to the normal usage of that phrase. But Ezekiel is not to mourn or weep or let his tears run down. He's to put on his turban and shoes, not cover his lips, not eat the bread of men. Now, in the funeral rites of that day, the mourner normally would tear his garments and put on sackcloth. He would remove his shoes and his headdress, and he would shave his head. The lower part of his face would be covered with a veil. The mourner would roll in the dust and then sit in a heap of ashes. He would fast for a day, after which his friends would bring him the bread of mourning. But the Lord instructed Ezekiel not to use these customs to mourn the loss of his wife. In fact, he was not to mourn at all, not even to shed tears. He was only to groan silently, inwardly. And I love that our Lord knows that he couldn't lose the delight of his eyes without at least that inward groan. There's no doubt this is hard. The prophets were often called to very hard things, especially in the last years of the divided kingdom. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, they had heavy burdens placed on them as God's prophets. I was talking to Hannah Gronseth this week, and she mentioned how struck she's been by Ezekiel's consistent obedience to what God tells him to do. And I think the vision of God's glory never left the prophet's eyes. God's greatness and purity and worthiness compelled him to obedience, just as Paul said that the love of Christ compelled him. I believe that the love and sacrifice and redemption of Christ, the glory and greatness and holiness of God, should compel us as well to obedience. So Ezekiel is called to this hard thing, to this grief ungrieved, and he does it. His wife dies in the evening, and the next day Ezekiel is out among the exiles in his shoes and turban, attracting attention by his obedience. Verses 19 to 24, and the people said to me, will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you are acting thus? Then I said to them, The word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul, and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword, and you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads, and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. I believe these exiled people already to a large extent sighed and groaned. They knew that most of the people of Jerusalem were still caught up in idol worship, looking to Egypt for rescue, and bringing judgment on themselves. Even so, the destruction of Jerusalem would be a huge blow to them. And so, knowing that God had already led Ezekiel into several symbolic acts, these people have the presence of mind to look at the upside-down way he was mourning and ask, what do these things mean to us? Isn't that a great question? (laughs) It's a question that we need to ask all the scriptures that we read, study, and hear preached. What, What do these things mean to me? And God answers, just as Ezekiel has lost the delight of his eyes, but must not mourn, so you, in the destruction of the temple, that just destruction, you shall not mourn. Now, the temple was the center of the Jewish faith and their practice. 
my sanctuary, they call it, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, the yearning of your soul. It was unthinkable to these people that that place be destroyed. So on a national level, this would be, this was as much of a tragedy as Ezekiel's loss of his wife was on a personal level. And yet these people were not to mourn as those who had no hope. They were to acknowledge God's justice, and as we'll see in a moment, hold on to hope. Even the human cost of this judgment, tragic though it was, your sons and daughters whom you left behind was not to be their main focus. Instead, you shall do, Ezekiel says, as I have done. They will respond to the suffering the same way, differently than the world would expect. They are to trust God in the midst of suffering. They are to recognize their own sin. You shall rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. I believe this is the equivalent to Ezekiel's inward groaning when he bore his suffering. But they are also to recognize and take hold of God as their Lord and their King. Verse 24, when this comes... You will know that I am the Lord God. We talked about this last week. God's desire, both in his mercy and in his judgment, is for people to know him. Not just know about him, but know that he is the Lord. This is the thread of hope that runs through this passage in this book. Despite judgment, there will come a day when Israel is restored, redemption accomplished, and God makes it possible for everyone to know him. But you might not notice that this is a thread of hope until you read the whole thought of Ezekiel, the whole book. Because as we've said, God communicates here by repetition and layering. So, verses 25 to 27. As for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take them from their stronghold, their joy and their glory, the delight of their eyes, and their soul's desire, and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. On that day your mouth will be open to the fugitive, and you shall speak and no longer be mute. So you will be a sign to them, and they will know that I am the Lord." It may not appear so at first glance, but this is a major pivot point in Ezekiel, one that structurally speaks this message of hope. In chapters 1 to 24, Ezekiel is focused on one message. The Jews who cling to idols or turn to the world for comfort will be destroyed with Jerusalem. But God will be with his remnant people in exile, those who hear his call, turn to him in repentance, and live. Then in chapter 25, the entire message changes. Now Ezekiel turns outward and prophesies against the nations around Israel, from Babylon to Sidon, and tells them they will not get away with harming God's people. By their own free choice and out of the evil of their fallen hearts, these nations and their rulers have attacked or are attacking God's people. Now it was in God's plan, but that doesn't relieve them of the responsibility for wrongdoing. They're guilty, and they'll be judged. Nation after nation comes before Ezekiel's prophetic gaze. Nation after nation is judged in specific prophetic terms with a judgment suited to their cultural characteristics and national sins. We'll look at a couple of these in the coming weeks. So that section The judgment of the nations continues until chapter 33, and there the message changes again. In Ezekiel 33, 21, we read that in the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been struck down. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the fugitive came. And he had opened my mouth by the time the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer mute. This is a fulfillment of what was promised in chapter 24. Ezekiel's God-given predictions are coming true, even in his own person. 
And then beginning in chapter 33, Ezekiel pours out new, hopeful, promise-filled prophecies culminating in the promise of a new heart and a new spirit in chapter 36 and the imagery of the valley of dry bones coming to life in chapter 37. And after that, Ezekiel continues to look forward, not to the return from exile, but to the thousand-year reign of Christ in Jerusalem and his eternal reign in the new heavens and the new earth. So he prophesies against the people of God and against the nations, but beginning in 33, he prophesies for the people of God and ultimately for the nations, the long-term vindication of God's plan and his promises to Abraham. And Ezekiel's muteness marks these turning points. In chapter 3, after Ezekiel had seen the vision of the glory of God, he was told, And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth, so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. From that time until this, chapter 24, Ezekiel has only said what God has told him to say. He has apparently had no freedom for conversation of his own, no small talk, no relational talk. Here in chapter 24, he's still mute in that sense. Not that he isn't bringing God's words to the nations, but he has been allowed only those words. No words of his own, possibly because what he would have said would have gone beyond what God was saying. But in chapter 33, as God frees him to talk about the hope laid before Israel, so also he frees him to use his own words to convey that hope. Chapter 33, my mouth was opened and I was no longer mute. Just as his suffering was a witness, so now his healing is a witness. The suffering and healing were used to get people's attention. Verse 27, on that day your mouth will be open to the fugitive and you shall speak and no longer be mute. So, you will be a sign to them and they will know that I am the Lord. You'll be a sign, a witness, you'll get their attention and they will know that I'm the Lord. So, what have we seen? When we don't respond to hardship the way people expect, we get their attention. We've also seen that God is ultimately a God of hope and rescue, and he'll redeem his people from the pit. He destroys Jerusalem for a time to purge his people of idolatry, but he does not destroy this remnant, and he never will. He will work their ultimate redemption in Jesus. But the application, I think, is in the way we handle suffering. The Bible promises that we will suffer. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. The apostle Peter states the principle of suffering as a witness to the world over and over. I want to look at a couple of these, or at least read them. He says, for example, in 1 Peter 2.20, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By your wounds, by his wounds, you have been healed. He suffered that we might be righteous. And Peter says, this is a witness, 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. 
For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Finally, 1 Peter 4.1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. There will be suffering. But how we suffer is a witness to the will and the word and the works of redeeming God. Now, I have to say that not all of our suffering is going to be like Ezekiel's. Though, in fact, we are called in Scripture not to mourn as others do who have no hope. But I think the principle applies much more widely. There should be a noticeable difference between how Christians go through the difficulties of life and how the rest of the world does it. We need to ask ourselves, how can my response to the events of this world, to the events of my life, show the difference a walk with God makes? Now, I recognize that the world around us is going crazy, deteriorating rapidly, in many ways worse off than I've ever seen it. But we don't have to panic about all this, because God hasn't panicked. And ultimately, all these events, all these evil choices will weave together into the good fulfillment of his plan and his purposes. In our own lives, the pains and sorrows, injuries and evils, conflicts, tragedies, losses, setbacks, are God's way of calling out our dependence on him, gaining the attention of a world that desperately needs him. C.S. Lewis famously said that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's true that our pain rouses us. It gets our attention. The pain of others rouses them. But they are also watching how we handle pain. And if we take it to the foot of the cross, casting our cares on him because he cares for us, if we have joy in the midst of sorrow, hope in the midst of despair, there will be eyes that see this. The stories I told a couple weeks ago about the medical missionaries cheerfully, apparently, trusting God while fighting Ebola are only one example of this. I've always appreciated the ministry of Johnny Erickson Tata. Not too many years ago, she spoke about a theology of suffering at Dallas Theological Seminary. Some of what she said is directly on point as we consider these truths and as we move toward communion. Let me play a few minutes of her conclusion. Because maybe when my accident happened, maybe the devil's motive was to Shipwreck the, shipwreck the faith of that young 17-year-old girl. Maybe it was to use her to make a mockery out of God's goodness. Maybe it was to defame his sweet character. But remember, God is in the business of aborting devilish schemes, always to serve his own ends and his own purposes. And God's motive in my accident was to abort that devilish scheme and turn a headstrong, stubborn, rebellious teenager into a young woman, oh my goodness, young woman, I'm going to be 60 this year, I can't believe it, (laughs) into a woman (laughs) who can reflect something of his patience, something of his perseverance, something of endurance, something of his character. And after 40 years in a wheelchair, I can say that my own suffering has lifted me up out of my spiritual slumber It's gotten me seriously thinking about the lordship of Christ in my life. It's helped convince the skeptical, cynical world that my God is worth trusting. I am loyal to him despite my affliction and infirmity. Last two lines, it's served to convince a cynical, skeptical world that my God is worth trusting. If suffering can do that, it will have served its purpose.